right at the beginning of the creation, God did something amazing with human beings. He, um, he made us differently, especially women. But human beings were created as something different than everything else. In fact, it's spelled out for us here in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God has created all of these other things before he created man. And he formed them out of the ground. That's what Genesis 2 tells us. So being formed by God out of the ground does not make man unique. In addition to that, he must have put the breath of life into them as well. Because we read later on that God had all of the creatures that had the breath of life in them go on the ark. It shouldn't be surprising to discover that we have some things in common with animals. However, the unique thing that the Bible tells us God did when it comes to the creation of man is he created man in his image. So God is the creator and what he did with us was he put creativity into us. He somehow or other, when he made us like him, uniquely endowed human beings with these creative abilities that the other creatures do not have. Now, there are multiple reasons why God did this. I'm going to start off with the reason that was just laid out in Psalm 150 that Lydia, uh, sorry, Leah read for us. It's to praise God. And everybody, every human being is born with this creative ability and I would suggest the urge to use it to praise our creator. But there are other reasons as well. Appreciating the creation. If you're a painter and you go and you look at the paintings that were done by great artists in the past, then you are going to have a kind of appreciation of what was done by that artist that is far greater than somebody who is not a painter. If you are an engineer and you are looking at engineered things, you are going to have a far greater appreciation for what occurred. Why else did he make us creative? He made us creative to bring us joy. Think about when you have done something creative in the past. You've written a poem. You've designed something. You've built something. You've painted something. You have done something that nobody has ever actually done before. You've invented something. It brings joy to us. 
but it also brings us knowledge about ourselves. We're going to get to that. Also, remember how it stresses there in Genesis 1 that man or human beings were put in charge of the creation. That doesn't mean that the creation was given to us to destroy or abuse for our own purposes. It means that we are God's husbandmen. We are here to care for this glorious thing that he created. And anybody who's ever had to solve problems understands that it requires creativity. We just cannot do it without this ability. So God gave us the ability to do the job that he assigned to us. And finally, and very importantly for us as Christians, he gave us this ability to share the truth of creation. So let's start off with praising the Creator. And I want you to look at this uh, beautiful piece of English. Is anybody familiar with this English poem? This is before English was polluted with French and a whole lot of Latin. This is real English. This is something called Cademan's Hymn. Cademan's Hymn. And it was written between 658 and 680 AD. There's an interesting story behind it. Cademan was not somebody who considered himself to be musically or artistically talented. He was embarrassed by his lack of ability. And yet one night, apparently he was a sincere person, one night he had a dream and an angel came to him in this dream and said, you are to sing. And Kederman's response was, but I'm not a, I'm not a singer. I'm not, I'm not talented in that area. But, he, but then he sort of stepped forward in faith and he said, what do you want me to sing about? We're going to find out. Here it is in Latin, uh, translated by the Venerable Bade. Because you speak English, you can start to see some Latin words in there that sound kind of English. Creatoris, patris, you know, that has something to do with father, right? Gloriae, Deus, a God, hominum, something to do with man, humani, uh, something to do with human beings, but you probably can't understand it. Okay. Here is a translation into modern English. And bear in mind that this is actually a translation of a translation. So we're not getting the original beauty of the Anglo-Saxon English. But we can get some hint of the message. Now we ought to praise the guardian of the heavenly kingdom. This is like an expression for God. The might of the creator and his conception, the work of the glorious father, as he of each of the wonders, eternal Lord, established the beginning. He first created for the sons of men, heaven as a roof, holy creator, then the middle earth, the guardian of mankind, the eternal Lord, afterwards made the earth for men, the Lord Almighty. 
Sounds a little bit garbled in modern English, but the message is clear. You see, Cainman was told to sing about the beginning of all things by this angel that came to him. And when he went to people and told them about this dream that he'd had, they said, well, sing us what you came up with. And he sang this. And you can think of this as being sort of the greatest hit of the, you know, seventh century in Britain. Okay? It, was, it was recognized as something special, something beautiful about the language, something beautiful about the music somehow that went with it. And <clears throat> he happened to be a cattle herder on the Abbey property that was run by somebody who my grandmother was named after, St. Hilda. And St. Hilda recognized something special about this and went to Cademan and said, God has visited you. You have a vocation. You have been called of God to serve him in using this talent that he has given you. And he accepted that calling. And interestingly enough, switched from being a, an uneducated um, herder of cattle to being a monk uh, in the abbey there. Uh, an interesting kind of story. We, uh, and it's interesting that we know these details about him. We don't know much else. But talents come from God and Hilda the Abbeus recognized that. When you see beautiful things, when you hear beautiful music, it comes from God because human beings were created in the image of God. So the first known English, which you've just seen here, praises the creator. The first Hebrew at the beginning of the Bible praises the creator. I know that there are people who say, oh, well, maybe there were other books that were written earlier than Genesis. Maybe Job was. Job may be older than Genesis, but it also points constantly to the creator, constantly. The other thing is that the creation account may be written in poetry. I keep asking my theologian friends for some help with this, and they can't seem to agree on whether the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 is poetry or whether it's a kind of special prose that's being used. But whatever it is, it is special language that is being used there. It's not ordinary language. There is something creative about the way in which Moses wrote this account down. Even among pagans, we see this impulse to use art to praise their understanding of God. And this is evident globally. I should tell you, I grew up in the Far East. And uh, where I lived, there were Hindus and there were Taoists, there were Buddhists, there were Muslims, and there were uh, my family and one or two others who were Christians. And I can tell you that everybody uses their creativity to praise the God they know. It is a, it is a human impulse to do that. Now, I went to a conference in 2003 and one of the speakers at that conference was an expert in language. And, it, and by the way, I hear this, this argument still repeated. It seems to be always by people who present themselves as experts in language in some way. And um, so he said that Genesis 1 and 2 can't accurately record history 
because they have a literary structure. Then he threw out this challenge to illustrate why it's impossible to have a literary structure and to be accurate historically. His challenge was this, to write a limerick about a young man living in Seattle. It could have been Sacramento, but there you go. I don't know why he chose Seattle. Maybe he thought that Seattle was a hard name to rhyme with, I don't know. But a limerick about a young man living in Seattle who comes to evangelistic meetings and six weeks later is baptized. So if that was history, could you write it in a limerick? And could you be accurate about it? What astonishes me is that people don't seem to understand that we have literary structures specifically for the purpose of communicating information. Okay? They are not the enemy of communicating information. They are the friend of communicating information. And of course, anyone could write a limerick with this information in it. This is the one I came up with. There was a young man from Seattle who with God and himself did battle after six weeks listening to Jesus freaks. He surrendered as one of God's cattle. Does it have the information in there? Of course it does. And I bet you, you'll remember the information a lot better because it's in the form of a limerick now. People use poetic forms not for the sake of just merely using a poetic form. People use poetic forms for the purpose of conveying something. And historical information can be conveyed beautifully and memorably using poetic forms. Let me give you an example of one you may be familiar with. How many of you have heard of this poem, Defense of Fort Henry? How many of you are Americans? Okay, good. This was written by somebody named Francis Scott Key. Have you heard of that person? Yeah, and the words go like this. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. Yeah, you've heard this sung very badly many times, haven't you? Yeah, it's a star-spangled banner. Let me ask you this. Was there a battle between the British and the Americans over control of Fort McHenry in Baltimore? Yeah. Did they shoot rockets? Was there rockets red glare? Were there bombs bursting in air? Was there a star-spangled banner? Of course there was. This is history recorded using poetry. So it should not be surprising to find that large portions of Scripture are written in poetic forms, not to confuse information, okay? not to hold back information or just to make silly rhymes, but this is brilliant people using their creativity to convey information in a magnificent way that we can celebrate today. So personally myself, I really don't care whether or not Genesis 1 or 2 are poetry or prose or something in between. What I know is this, Moses, when he wrote those words down, wrote them down in a brilliant and creative way so that you can know that you are created in the image of God and I can know that I am created in the image of God. Even though we are fallen human beings, even though we are broken and need 
to become new creations, we have absolute assurance because of the way that Moses wrote this down that this is important and truthful information. It is absolutely ridiculous and preposterous to argue this is poetry, therefore it's not history. That's not our experience with poetry. You know, when Victor Hugo wrote the retreat from Moscow, did Napoleon's armies not retreat from Moscow? Did they not freeze to death? Was it not horrible and horrifying? And did he not capture that in poetry in a way that prose never could? Did he not have a daughter whom he walked to after she died through the frost with flowers in his hand to put on her grave? Okay. Because he wrote a poem about that. Okay. It happened. That's why he wrote the poem. I bet that you can think of many, many poems. Was there no charge of the light brigade? I mean, it's just a preposterous assertion that poetry means not history or not accurate in some way. What about appreciating the creation? The, the fact that something is brilliantly created tells us something positive about it, not something negative appreciating the creation. Yeah, I'm going to go over this quickly because I don't want to go on forever. I want you to come and listen to this afternoon when we talk about other things. But this is Sir Isaac Newton. Okay. Now think about what scientists do. We go and we study the creation. Okay. And when we find things in the creation, we discover that God knew all about that before we did. And that's what Isaac Newton is talking about here. He says, how came the bodies of animals to be contrived with so much art? And for what ends were there several parts? Was the eye contrived without skill in optics and the ear without knowledge of sounds? Of course, the knowledge comes first. That's the way things work in reality. As you know, there is a theory out there, a theory of evolution, a theory that disallows God. God who is omniscient, he is all-knowing. That is why God can be the creator, because he knows about optics, he knows about sound, he knows about everything, and therefore he can create you, he can create cats, he can create oak trees, he can create the grass that the cattle he created can eat, and so on. Okay? God knows about these things, and the beauty and joy of studying the creation comes from realizing what the Creator knew before I knew it. Okay? It's very, very exciting. Okay? Just as an artist can appreciate another artist's painting, maybe more than I can, I have the joy of being able to appreciate a little tiny bit of what the greatest artist has done. All right. So um, we also experience joy in understanding or knowing our creativity. And um, uh, so what I'm going to do is we're all going to be creative here this morning. Okay? This, is, this is a risky experiment, but you will find that you have a square piece of paper 
And we are going to make one of these paper cranes. And to do this, you'll notice that this piece of paper has different numbers and lines and things on each side. I'm gonna put aside one of these sheets that I have. And if you look on the side with less numbers on it, you'll see that there is a one up here and a one down here. To do this, to do this, all you have to be able to do is count, okay? So you can look up at the screen where I've kind of recorded how to do this. You can also go to that URL if you want to look at the video again to figure it out. But we're gonna put numbers together. So where there's a one here and a one here, we're gonna fold it over and put those ones together. All right. I love making these things. Yeah. Then you'll see that on one side there's a two here and a two here. So we're gonna put the, the, the two twos together. We'll get another triangle just like that. There we are. And now, let's see, there's a three and a three that are gonna to go together, like this. And then a four and a four on the other side. Four's there and four's there. Okay, now we're just going to sort of open things up a little bit. And you'll see that there's a five here and a five here. We're just going to reverse those two folds that we just did. We're kind of making a hinge in the paper. There we go, I just put the two sixes together. All right, so I think the next bit is a tricky one because if you open this up, you'll see seven on this side of the paper and a seven on this side. How do we get those to go together? Gonna sort of open it up and Fold it into the middle, and then you've got the seven there and the seven there. You can just fold them over themselves. And you see the same situation with the eights. Eight on this side, eight on that side. You need to open things up and just fold it inside out. I'm amazed at the brain that thought of this in the first place. So now we need nine. If you look on one side, there's a nine there and a nine there. You know, in the video, I did it good and slowly. So anyone can follow along. So we're going to fold the nine over on itself. Do you see all those lines on the paper? They give you a hint about where the folds are supposed to go. And then 10 is gonna go, yeah. There we go. It's gonna look something like this. I hear lots of folding activity going on. That's great. We're all being creative together. I tested this out at the retirement home. Whoops, I need to be doing the other side. So 11 needs to go with 11.
and 12 needs to go with 12. Yeah, so then you can see there's a 13 up here and a 13 down here. We're just, for this bit, we're really just making a hinge. You know. Flip over and 14 is going to come down to 14, like that. And now the next bit is probably as tricky as it gets. Okay. It's not that hard. You need to open up one of these sides and just lift up the top piece of paper and you'll see on the inside there are numbers that go together. And it's just going to turn. Can you imagine the brain that came up with this in the first place? It wasn't me. There we go. Like that. And on the other side, we're going to do exactly the same thing. So what number are we up to now? 20, I think. We've only got nine steps to go. Okay, and if you've done it right, you'll see that there's sort of two legs down here at the bottom and two bits up here at the top that, that, um, that you can't move in that way. So the next thing is, let's see here, 21. So we're gonna take this, like, oops, like that. And on the other side, right over here, there's 22. So those 22s are gonna to go together. Yeah, this one can be a little bit tricky too. If you just hold it down here where I'm holding it and you just bend it over, you'll get Usually, there we are. Get to be like that. And oops, like that. So it'll look a little bit like, I don't know, maybe a cow's skull or something with horns on it. Next thing, you're gonna make the head of your crane. That's 25. You just sort of bend it over and fold it back in like that. And, oh, now the wings. All right, so 20, was it 26 to 26? And then 27 to 27. It's kind of at an angle, an angle like, like that. And we'll do exactly the same thing on the other side, 28. And then 29. And now, for those of you who made it this far, right, you should have a uh, bird that looks like this. But these are kind of cool ones, cool cranes, because if you hold them right and pull the tail, they flap their wings. I always like these, these ones that, uh, that do something. I should, I should tell you that uh, when I did the test run at, at my 
mother-in-law's place. Uh, one of my friends from Singapore was there, and he turned the, in the result that he got it was a frog. So, uh, yeah, he was being creative. Uh, in any case, if you want to try, you know, I can, I, can, um, I can give you some help after church or something if you want to try it again. Or if you go to that website, you'll be able to um, look at the video again and see how it's done. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's a creative activity. It's a fun thing. Did anybody do it successfully? Yes, see, somebody's taking, I hope somebody's taking joy. All right, good, good, good. Somebody's taking joy in being creative. God, want, God gave us this creativity to, to give us that sense of accomplishment, that sense of joy, that sense of appreciation for what he did. So um, did making this crane make you happy? I hope so, yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Is, is your paper crane still a sheet of paper? Yes, it is. Okay. It's still a sheet of paper. Did your folding of the paper transform it into something more than just a sheet of paper? Yes. Yeah. It's no longer just a sheet of paper. It's a paper crane. Now, You'll notice that I put a sheet of this paper here and just left it alone. Did gravity turn it into a paper crane? Did the laws of nature turn it into a paper crane? Uh, what process other than human creativity and intelligence would result in a paper crane? Would would time do it? Do you think if I left this here for a thousand years, it would turn into a paper crane? What if there was a tornado that came through this church? Would that turn it into a paper crane? No. Okay. The only thing that's going to turn that piece of paper into a paper crane is you, right? Um, natural laws won't do it, time won't do it. In terms of elegant engineering abilities and complexity, how does your paper crane compare with a real crane? Yeah, you know, um, this is a crane I photographed in Africa. Um, <laughs> it's night and day, isn't it? Um, yeah. Given that real cranes are made out of simple atoms, does that mean they're just atoms? Okay. Or are they something more? Okay. Some, people, um, uh, some people in science believe we should practice something called reductionism, where we're always going down to the simplest thing. And if we can understand the simplest level, then we understand whatever it is that we're um, looking at. But understanding atoms does not mean that I understand you. I remember when the human genome was published and somebody made the comment that now we know what it is to be human because we know the sequence of letters, basically, in, in our genome. No, we don't. We have no idea what it is to be human on the, on the basis of that. It's fabulous and interesting information, but just because something's made out of atoms doesn't mean it's only atoms or that it's going to happen all by itself. Knowing what it took to make a paper crane, what must it take to make a real crane? Okay. It's a kind of wisdom that I lack and you. Time and laws are not going to get the job done any more than it's going to turn this piece of paper into a paper crane. It's just not going to happen. And by the way, I just want you to note 
that time and natural laws and matter and space and things like that, they actually don't come for free either. Okay, those are created things. Your intrinsic creativity is unique evidence of the Bible's accuracy when it records that humans were made in the image of the Creator. There are lots of intelligent animals out there, okay? But a chimpanzee is not going to turn this into a paper crane. An elephant isn't going to turn this into a paper crane. A crow isn't going to turn this into a paper crane. Okay. You, you alone, among the creation here on earth, have the ability to do that. God gave you that ability. So, even if we believe that everything else was a product of chance and natural laws, the unique property of creativity that humans possess requires a different cause from the other created things. Something special about the cause of your creativity. Because other things don't have it. Okay. You are special. You are unique. Every creative act we do lets us know that we are created in the image of God. So if you find that you're doubting, sit down and do a drawing of something. Sit down and write a poem. Sit down and play a piece of music on the piano. Sit down and compose a song. Sit down and, you know, design I don't know, a new car. You have some kind of amazing creative ability. Everybody does. Everybody does. If you're doubting, do it. Use your ability and know that you were created in the image of your creator. That's why you can do that. What about managing the creation? We're going to be quick with this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God put us in charge. And as I already said, he gave us the ability to solve problems. That is a creative thing. It's not just that we have the ability to, you know, figure out how to, um, uh, you know, solve mathematical equations and stuff like that. God gave us the ability to solve complex problems so that we can care for his creation. What about sharing the truth about creation? Here's a piece of art, okay? And um, this piece of art was created by um, the, the great Adventist artist, Ellen G. White. And uh, it is designed to help us understand something. And I want you to notice what she did. Because art is a way of communicating. In fact, that is the reason for art. The artist is communicating something with other people. They're sending a message. So Ellen White here is telling the story of salvation. But I want you to notice something about what she used. Does that look kind of familiar to you? You're familiar with The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. 
And Leonardo da Vinci, he didn't just make up this painting. Okay? He, was, he had been studying paintings and uh, the, the, that had been made by the Romans a thousand years before him. And he took some of their forms to create this image that is so iconic to us. As Westerners, it resonates with us. Over here, I'm interested to see how Adam and Eve are coming out of the garden. And can you see that while I, I can't say that I found the exact painting or whatever that that came from, can you see the same kinds of elements to it? Adam covering his face in shame. Eve is behind him. The angel is driving them out. Uh, by the way, that kind of angel was not invented by Christians. Christians took this kind of depiction of an angel that had been being made by the Romans and used that because it was something that people in that culture understood. Okay, so if you want to tell people about an angel, you, you need to tell them. This is not how angels are described in the Bible. Go and have a look at descriptions of angels. They're either described as a man or there's this detailed description where they have six wings and they're covering their body with one and so on. You can go into some churches, ironically in Rome, and see that kind of other kind of angel. Or if you go into Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, you see this kind of um, six-winged angel as described in scripture. But I choose to use something with that depiction of angels. It's because you understand that's an image of an angel and she conveying something. She is putting in images that you understand to convey a message, to tell you the story of salvation. So I want to tell you a story. I grew up in the Far East, um, and we were living in Thailand. One of the uh, missionaries there was a guy named Clifton Mabley. And Clifton came um, one day and he said, hey, why don't you come over to our place in Ubon, uh, which was over actually in the east of Thailand. Um, I'm driving there tonight. Come on, let's, let's go. Yeah. And um, I'd known Clifton, frankly, I think just about my entire life. So this wasn't an unusual thing. So we got in, uh, in, in his truck we drove all night and talked. And as we drove, we started talking about something that was really on my mind. How? How can we reach people with the gospel? How? how why are we so unsuccessful? Why are there hardly any Christians at all in Thailand? How could, how could this unbelievably evil Marxist philosophy have taken over Cambodia? How did this happen? And how, how, can, how can we give the hope that we have as Christians to these people, how do we do it? Well, Clifton had this idea. It was all his brilliance. He said, we need to be doing this. We need to be doing what Ellen White was doing, okay? We need to be creative about how we're going to reach these people. And um, this here is what he came up with. Now, 
If you're familiar with Buddhist temples in Thailand, you will recognize this particular style of painting. The way that religious ideas are communicated there is through this style of art. And so he came up with a series of four paintings painted in the style that people would understand. Just as Ellen White in the 19th century used images that you and I can understand, they used images that Thai people can understand. Interestingly enough, there was a complex response to these. It's a pity, really. You know, people sometimes get suspicious of new things or new ideas. Is this syncretism? What's going on here? These paintings are fabulous, okay? Because they communicate ideas that Thai people would not be expected to have ever encountered before. The idea of a new earth, the idea of a new creation, the idea of salvation. These are things that are not even on the horizon. So he chose the right things to, to get these paintings done about. What's my point? My point is creativity is what we need to be using if we wish to share the everlasting gospel with the world. And that is what brings us to the second piece of paper that you have, okay? We're going to fold a kind of paper airplane and we're going to do what you are never, never allowed to do in church. We're going to make paper airplanes and throw them, okay? And again, the same, the same principle works with these. If you weren't successful with the, um, with the crane, you will be successful with the aeroplane. It's, it's much simpler. You see the one up here and the one down here. We're going to fold it so that those two ones go together. So we're just folding the piece of paper in half like this. There we are. And then we're going to open it up again. You'll see I've given you space there where you can write things, but we won't do that for the sake of time this morning. But you can see there's a two here and a two down here. So we, we're just going to fold that over like that. And then three is exactly the same, just the mirror image. And then four involves just taking the four from there down to here, to the four down there. Just like that, you'll see me do it on, in the video here in just a second. Great thing about paper planes is they're a lot simpler than paper cranes. And the next bit is, a, is the tricky bit with this particular kind of plane. You'll see I put a little tiny mark here and a little tiny mark there and a little tiny mark there. So I'm going to take this number five here and that corner is going to line up with this mark and you'll see the crease will be close to the mark that you see up there. So... Oh, I love hearing that paper folding sound. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. So it's going to look like that. And you do the same thing on the other side with the six. Okay. And then... You'll see there's a seven here 
and a seven here. You see it there, I'm pointing it out on the screen. So let's fold the seven over onto the other seven. There we go, it looks, looks like that. And now you'll see the eights on the other side. We'll fold those together. And this line here is important. We want to fold it so that the nine comes down there along that line. Okay. And if you look at this particular point, you should see something on there that the Bible calls the everlasting gospel. Okay. This is the first angel's message. Christians gave us one job to do. One job. To share this. Okay. So I want you to just hang on to that for a moment. Don't throw it yet. Here it is. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. That's what these aeroplanes are going to do in a moment. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to so every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Okay, so this is the one. This is, this is what we're supposed to be sharing with Thai people who I grew up with. Malaysian people who I grew up with, Singaporeans who I grew up with, Australians where I was born, people in Sacramento, Californians, probably the hardest yet. Okay? This is what we're supposed to do. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, okay, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and... Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Worshiping the creator is at the center of this message. Imagine, imagine standing up in the middle of Sacramento and saying, the hour of God's judgment has come. How much enthusiasm are you going to get in response to that? No, nobody wants to believe it. What, what am I supposed to do? Look forward to being burned in some lake of fire or going to hell or something? That's what people are going to think, right? That's what they're going to think until we explain to them what God's judgment is. What does the book of Revelation tell us God is going to do? Okay. Yes, there's a lake of fire. But he is going to wipe every tear from our eyes. Right? He is going to do a new creation. The new creation is God's judgment. That's why it makes logical sense to worship the creator of all things. Now. Okay. That's what we have to share with our neighbors. So my idea is that making a plane like this with the everlasting gospel on it, okay, it's a symbol. It's a symbol. But I want those of you who successfully made one, let's see how they fly. Let's see them flying in the midst of heaven, okay? I'll say one, two, three, and we'll let them loose. One, two, Three. Whoa, yes. <laughs> That's fabulous. I can't believe how many of you were successful. Uh, did some, you know what? I was so busy looking down here. Did some come down from up there? I hope so. You know, okay, we don't usually do this stuff in church, but it's okay to be creative. 
you are going to remember, okay? And I hope you kids up there are going to remember as well. We have one job to do. If you think you might forget what your job is, go ahead and pick up one of these plates on the way out and save, save, save the uh, uh, deacons and deaconesses the trouble of cleaning up the church. Take it home as a, as a, uh, as a souvenir. Yes. Our text for today. Look at all of the different creative ways that David is pointing out in which we can praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Hey, we just did. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Not in an Adventist church, of course. Um, Praise him with the stringed instruments and uh, flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Wow, you know, praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you have breath, figure out what talent, figure out what creative abilities God has given to you. It might be the ability to connect with other people. Okay? It might be the ability to make fabulous images that convey information about God's plan of salvation. It may be the ability to write songs. You know, whatever it is, don't suppress it. Okay? Try it. Try it. Yeah. I'm going to end with the words of a recent Nobel laureate in literature. And you're going to be surprised at who it is. Okay? But I want you to consider this. Okay? If this person can praise God and tell others about what God is going to do, with his talent. Think about what you can do. Surrender your crown on this blood-stained ground. Take off your mask. He sees your deeds. He knows your needs even before you ask. How long can you falsify and deny what is real? How long can you hate yourself for the weakness you conceal? Of every earthly plan that be known to man, he is unconcerned. He's got plans of his own to set up his throne when he returns. Amen. Who do you think this is? Yeah, it's Bob Dylan. This is a guy with unbelievable talent. And you know what? It may not be your style and it may not be my style, but he's out there telling the world, telling people that I can't reach and you can't reach about what God's going to do. If he can do it, you can do it. Because God has given each of us amazing talents, amazing creativity, creativity that separates us from the rest of the creation, because of that, we can have hope that he is going to create something new in us, that he is going to come, and when he sets up his throne... Our hope can be for a new creation. Thank you and God bless you.